Hello everyone, and welcome back to our series on quantum computing. In the previous video, we established a general formalism for measurement in open systems via POVMs. In this video, we will use the POVM formalism to describe the evolution of quantum systems via quantum channels. I will cover quantum channels in two parts. First, I will cover the theory of quantum channels in this video, and in the next video, I will go through some important examples of quantum channels in practice. For closed systems, we previously saw that quantum states evolve via unitary operations. For instance, we could have a state in a bipartite system AB that undergoes unitary evolution. However, suppose we are interested in only the evolution of subsystem A. How could we characterize the evolution of the state in this case? Well, we essentially want a map E known as a quantum channel that maps an initial density matrix for A to the final density matrix for A. Since E maps operators to operators, it is also known as a superoperator. And since the superoperator maps physical density matrix states to other physical density matrix states, it is called a physically realizable superoperator. Okay, so how exactly do we describe this quantum channel? Well, as it turns out, there are four equivalent formalisms for the quantum channel, all of which will be explored in this video. These include the isometric definition via the Steinspring dilation, the Krauss operator decomposition, the CPTP map, and the Choi isomorphism. Let's start with the Steinspring dilation. Getting back to our discussion on mapping density matrices, we mentioned that evolution of quantum states for closed systems is unitary. Well, if we consider the combination of an open system A along with its environment B, we get a closed system. Let us assume that our system A is initially unentangled with B, and that the state of B is pure. By convention, we simply have that the state of B is simply the zero state, but it doesn't really matter what the state is. Essentially, the idea is that we apply some unitary U to the joint state of A and B at which point we then measure B without reading its measurement outcome, which gives us a mixed state in A. We can express this mathematically as follows in terms of the partial trace. To express this more concisely, simply as a function of the state of A alone, we can introduce an isometric embedding W that maps a given state Xi to Xi tensor 0. Defining the isometry V equals UW, we have the following concise expression for the quantum channel. An isometry is simply an operator that preserves the inner product, meaning that V dagger V equals the identity. And of course, since W is also an isometry, we have that W dagger W is also equal to the identity. Isometries are more general than unitaries since they aren't required to be square matrices, meaning that VV dagger is not equal to the identity in general, for instance. This special isometry V is called the Steinspring dilation, and it gives us one way of representing the action of a quantum channel via partial trace. For the Krauss operator interpretation of the quantum channel, let's start with the isometric definition. Using the definition of partial trace, we can expand out this expression as follows, where the xi i kets form an orthonormal basis for the Hilbert space of B. We can then define the action of this identity tensor bra operator on V as an operator m sub i. Furthermore, if we take the full trace of both sides, we can also use cyclicity of trace to get that the expected value of the sum of m i dagger m i must be 1 for all choices of rho. The only way this can happen is if this sum is the identity. Consequently, we have the following operator decomposition of the quantum channel with the following normalization condition. These MI operators should look familiar, since these are exactly the same operators we discussed in the last video on generalized measurement. In the context of quantum channels, these operators are known as Krauss operators. There's an intuitive explanation as to why these operators show up here. In particular, if you imagine that we have some pure state psi A, which is tensor with 0B, acting on this with a unitary U gives us the following decomposition as we saw in the last video. If we now measure B without observing the measurement outcome, we then get the following mixed state. By linearity, this means that for any density matrix rho, we get the following mapping, which is exactly the Krauss operator decomposition that we recovered here. 
Of course, we can also recover an isometric def definition of the channel from the Krauss operators by substituting these m sub i operators into the definition of the unitary given in the generalized measurement framework, and then having psi map to this output directly instead of psi tensored with zeros. Let's now consider the third formalism for quantum channels, CPTP maps. Abstractly, we have that a quantum channel is a CPTP map and vice versa. A linear map is CPTP if and only if it is completely positive and trace preserving. Intuitively, we have that trace preserving means that the trace of the operator the superoperator acts on is preserved. Positive simply means that PSD matrices are mapped to other PSD matrices. Note that here, I am assuming that the map is between the same Hilbert spaces, since we are only considering how a given state changes under the channel. But this doesn't necessarily have to be true in general, so it's important to keep that in mind. Since quantum channels map density matrices to other density matrices, which are always PSD and have trace 1, these two properties make sense. However, in order for such a map to actually be a quantum channel, we require a stricter requirement than just positivity, that being complete positivity. Complete positivity means that if we extend the quantum system by an auxiliary system of any dimension, such that the action of the quantum channel is trivial on this new system, positivity is still preserved. This is essential because if our system that the quantum channel is acting on is entangled with another system, the local action of the quantum channel could still potentially cause a density matrix for the whole system to have negative eigenvalues. As an example of a positive but not completely positive superoperator, consider the real transpose operation. Taking the transpose of any Hermitian matrix leaves the eigenvalues unchanged, meaning that we trivially map PSD operators to PSD operators. So the superoperator is trivially positive. However, consider what happens if we act on the density matrix for the Bell state phi plus, with the transpose acting on the second qubit and the identity acting on the first. Here, I'm going to ignore the normalization constant for the sake of simplicity. Since the density matrix only has four non-zero elements, we simply consider the action of the channel on those four elements at the corners, and just use linearity. Here, you can see that we get the following block matrix as the output, which is actually just the matrix for the swap gate. If we look at the block matrix in the middle, you can see that we have this poly X matrix, which has eigenvalues plus and minus one. Since this block is not PSD, we have that the whole matrix cannot be PSD. Consequently, if we extend the Hilbert space, we do not guarantee that positive operators get mapped to positive operators. Consequently, we have that the transpose superoperator is positive, but not completely positive. Altogether, based on the restrictions that we described, we have that quantum channels are equivalent to CPTP maps. For our last interpretation, we will look at choice states. The basic premise is as follows. Suppose we have a tripartite system ABC, where A is in state rho, and BC is maximally entangled in a state called omega, which I have defined as follows. Note that here, I am just assuming that all three systems are d-dimensional. If we're working with n qubits, of course, d will simply be 2 to the n, but I have left this as just a general dimension d for now. Here, I will use the subscript notation to indicate which system each density matrix is part of. So even though the state itself is labeled as just rho, if system A is in state rho, I will say that the state is rho sub A. Or if system B is in state rho, I will instead say that the system is in state rho sub B, and so on and so forth. Okay, suppose I want to take rho A and compute the state E of rho C, possibly destroying the state of A in the process. Well, we can accomplish this by first projecting AB onto the maximally uh, entangled state previously described on BC. In practice, you can't actually choose which entangled state to project onto, but in this case, uh, all that happens if we don't project into omega, but rather some other maximally entangled state, is just that we perform some unitary transformation on rho, which depends on the measurement outcome, which pretty much is just a poly operation. Consequently, 
we can just undo this operation based on the measurement outcome we get. Nevertheless, for the sake of simplicity, we will assume that the intended projection is performed. Defining the new state of the entire system as sigma, we have that this particular projection effectively turns the state of C into rho. This is actually a special case of a protocol called quantum teleportation, which we will discuss in a few videos when we move to our next section on entanglement. We can now just apply E to system C in order to get E of rho sub C as we desired. However, note that these two steps are actually interchangeable, since the operators are acting non-trivially on completely separate Hilbert spaces. Consequently, suppose that we first apply I tensor E to the maximally entangled state over BC. We then get a new state which I'll define as eta over D. This matrix eta is referred to as the Choi state or Choi matrix, and we will discuss what it represents shortly. If we now project system AB onto omega, we have that the new state of system C becomes E of rho, as we explained before. If we expand out this projection, we get the following expression for the quantum channel in terms of the Choi matrix. Consequently, using the Choi matrix, we can derive what's called the choi yamiokoski isomorphism between quantum channels and these choi density matrices. This correspondence is therefore also referred to as channel state duality. Okay, that's all well and good, but what does the choi matrix actually look like? Well, there's a few ways to look at this matrix. Firstly, it is of course defined simply as I tensor E acting on omega with this additional factor of D, which I have added by convention. Expanding out omega, we get this form of the Choi matrix, which is just these input basis matrices tensored with their output under the quantum channel. If we write this as a block matrix, we get the following nice representation of the Choi matrix. Okay, but how does this relate to the other descriptions we had of quantum channels? Well, as it turns out, there's a very nice intuition that links the Choi state to Krauss operators. In particular, since the Choi state is a scale density matrices, matrix, we can write the Choi state as a sum of these pure state-like objects. Here, I've absorbed the weight into the actual definition of these vectors in the sum, so the norms of the vectors are not assumed to be one. Consider a mapping of the following form between the maximally entangled state omega and these states defined by m sub i. Doing some algebraic manipulation and substitution, we can show that these m sub i operators are actually just Krauss operators for the quantum channel. That's all well and good, but how do we actually find these operators? Well, if you expand out the relationship between psi sub i and m sub i, we can see that each psi sub i effectively consists of the columns of m sub i stacked on top of each other into one big column vector. Consequently, we can easily reshape this vector into a matrix to recover what m sub i actually is. This means that we can actually use the eigenvectors and eigenvalues of the Choi matrix to find the Krauss representation that uses the minimum number of operators. Furthermore, there is also a nice correspondence between the properties of the Choi state and the properties of CPTP maps. In particular, we have that a map is completely positive if and only if the Choi state is PSD, giving us a nice way of testing this property. Furthermore, we have that a given map is trace-preserving if and only if the partial trace of the corresponding choice state over the system over which the channel acts on gives the identity matrix. Altogether, quantum channels give us a robust method for studying the evolution of open systems and can be represented through a variety of different formalisms. In the next video, we will study specific examples of quantum channels, including the depolarizing, dephasing, and amplitude dampening channels. I hope you enjoyed this video, and I will see you next time.